So what are the clinical features of Alagili syndrome? Remember that in total, five systems are affected. So five systems getting involved is the hallmark of the disease. The first system which gets involved is the liver and biliary tract. They are also considered to be the major systems involved or the major clinical determinants of the disease. Various ways it has been mentioned. The second system which is involved and called as a major system involved that is the vertebral or bony involvement. Thirdly, we have the congenital heart diseases that is the cardiac involvement. Fourth, we have abnormal facies. They have a very characteristic face. And the fifth feature is eye involvement, which mainly involves your anterior chamber abnormalities. So these are the five major systems which are involved. And uh, when you will look, will look at the diagnosis, you would know that uh, the original disease when it was described, they used to say that when on histology you find positive of bile duct and any three systems out of these five are involved, that was diagnostic, but that diagnostic criteria is no longer strictly followed. So these are the five major systems. Let us go system wise. First of all, we'll talk about the most important system which determines the outcome that is liver and biliary tract. The hallmark of this condition is a thing called as bile duct positive. In these patients, there is absence or reduction in the number of interlobular biliary ducts or interlobular bile ducts in the portal triads. You know that in portal triad, there is a biliary ductule, there is a uh, remnant of portal vein and there is a uh, member of uh, the hepatic arterial system. So artery, vein, portal vein and interlobular bile duct, they are present in a portal triad. The other two will be normally present, but interlobular bile ducts will be absent from those portal triads. That is the hallmark of the condition on histology. The neonatal forms, uh, these patients you will find that the neonatal uh, forms show conjugated hyperbilirubinemia due to cholestasis. So they will have the typical neonatal jaundice-like presentation which can mimic biliary atresia also. Some of the patients will show resolution of jaundice as the age advances but cholestasis will persist and intractable pruritus may persist. In fact, in older children, you will find that rather than jaundice, it is pruritus which is the more troublesome symptom. Second feature is dysmorphic facies. That these children are found to have facial dysmorphism. It produces a face called as triangular face appearance, potential MCQ point. Triangular face is a feature of which hepatic syndrome? The answer will be Ellagili syndrome. When, when I say triangular face appearance, what are the morphological features that you will find in these individuals? So, triangular face, these children will have a pointed chin, often with a small mandible, which obviously will not be visible immediately. You, you need to do x-ray for that. Secondly, they will have frontal bossing. So, bo frontal bossing of the skull will be seen. Third, they will have deep set eyes, often present with mild hypertelorism, that is increased gap between the two eyes, widely placed deep set eyes. Fourth, they will have a long straight nose with a bulbous tip. So, they will have a long straight nose with bulbous tip. Fifth, they will have prominent and sometimes forward turned ears. So, prominent ears will be present in these individuals. And again, lastly, which may or may not be present, they may have angles of the mouth which are drooping a bit. It is a plus minus sign. Look at this picture. This is a child who is having a typical triangular face appearance and she is having features of Ellagili syndrome. What are the dysmorphic facies you can see? Uh, there, there is a bulbous tip which is present. There is There are prominent ears 
and there is a prominent pointed chin that produces a so called triangular face appearance. This type of an appearance is called as a triangular face appearance. These signs are subtle. You need to, you know, examine the child and then if you get a visual in the exam, it will be such a prominent, it will be such a classical picture that if you remember these features, you will immediately be able to know. It will strike you that this is a triangular face and allergy syndrome as a differential will come to your mind. So, this is the feature that you need to remember in this child. Moving to the next uh, set of features that is congenital heart disease. This is an MCQ already asked in super speciality exam. So, you will put a point called as Q. The most common congenital heart disease in these patients is peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. So, peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis is the most common congenital heart disease followed by pulmonary valvular stenosis. followed by other conditions which include tetralogy of fallow, ASD, VSD, coarctation of aorta, aortic stenosis and sometimes TAPVC. These are the common congenital heart diseases that we find. Fourthly, axial skeleton and vertebral defects. The classic hallmark finding in them is the so called butterfly vertebra. Butterfly vertebra gives an appearance of butterflies because the anterior laminae sometimes fail to fuse and there are concavities which are produced. It is better seen than described. This will be visible on x-ray spine anterior posterior view. In addition, you will find other vertebral anomalies like hemivertebrae. There may be fusion of the adjacent vertebrae. Spina bifida occulta also called a spinal dysraphism may occur. Rarely, you may find features like pointed C1 anterior process short ulna, absence of 12th rib and increased risk of metabolic bone disease. These are the points which are not mentioned in Nelson but mentioned in other standard books. And if I have to show you a diagram, this is how butterfly vertebra will look like. The, the appearance is just like that of a butterfly. So, that is called as a butterfly vertebra. So, if you get a photograph like this, one, the strong possibility is this is allergy syndrome. Next is ocular involvement or eye involvement. The, in ocular involvement, as I said, anterior chamber defects will be common, but the most common significant abnormality that we find is called as posterior embryotoxon. What is posterior embryotoxon? There is a line in the eye called as Schwalbe's line. Schwalbe's line is present at the junction of iris and cornea. This line in these patients become excessively thickened and slightly anteriorly placed. So, when you do slit lamp microscopy, you will be able to find a prominent line present laterally on the eyeball that is called as posterior embryotoxon. So, there will be thickening and anterior displacement of the Schwalbe's line at the junction of iris and cornea. It is seen in almost 90 percent cases. It is a very subtle finding but seen in 90 percent cases and slit lamp microscopy will be needed in these individuals. Then there is another anomaly which is associated with posterior embryotoxon. It is called as Exenfeld anomaly, also called Exenfeld and Rieger syndrome. In these patients, there are peripheral iris strands which are attached to this posterior embryotoxon. Again, it, you need to do slit lamp microscopy to see this anomaly. Third is abnormality involving the optic nerve head which is called as optic nerve drusen or optic disc drusen. There will be a calcified deposit in the extracellular space around the optic nerve head. You need to do ocular ultrasound examination to identify this finding. And then there can be other eye abnormalities. The list you need to just go through once. There is microcornea, there is a shallow anterior chamber, there is high myopia and there is pigmentary changes in the retina, the so called retinitis pigmentosa. They all can sometimes be seen. So, if I have to show you a picture of slit lamp microscopy, look at this. Can you see that there is a prominent line, this white line which is being mentioned. This is your posterior embryotoxon. Now, because we are using illumination from this side, so it is appearing as a white line. If you do not use illumination, it will appear as a thick and dark line like this. Look at this. This thickening of this line, this prominent line which is getting formed here, this is called as the Schwalbe's line and it 
normally it is it is not visible like this it is very thin and it forms a part of the boundary of the eyeball but it becomes thickened and is displaced anteriorly producing this condition none of us are ophthalmologists we are not going to do slit lamp examination but at least the visual the spotter the thing to identify you should know that what are we looking at and secondly what is the condition in which we look at so both of them are versions of posterior embryotoxon which is the ocular hallmark of allagili syndrome then we have some rare features also previously called as minor features which includes short stature short stature is multifactorial it may be related to nutritional deficiencies because of cholestasis it may also be related to hypothyroidism which is seen in some of these individuals secondly you will have pancreatic insufficiency it is exocrine pancreatic insufficiency which is common then tubulo interstitial nephropathy can be seen in some individuals leading to renal changes and uh, changes in the urinary sediment defective spermatogenesis in case of males but it is a variable finding it may or may not be present then vasculopathy there is increased risk of moya moya syndrome and stroke in these patients xanthomas will form with hypercholesterolemia features of vitamin e deficiency producing ataxia will be sometimes seen in these individuals.